In about a year from now, a year and a half, the fate of a small country in our neighborhood is going to have ripple effects across the world. In the last decade, Afghanistan and the war in Afghanistan has, in a sense, defined the world. Now, as the American forces prepare to pull out, there is a great sense of anxiety about what it will mean, not just for Afghanistan, but its neighboring countries and this whole terror project, as we have uh, come to call it. But this war has also killed 30,000 civilians, many soldiers, it's devastated economies, and it has left the Taliban in some senses stronger. It has also left many, many insurgent groups. So what did this war mean? What is it leaving behind? What did it accomplish? And finally, what will it mean for the people of Afghanistan? Can you custom stitch democracies onto people? To talk about these things and to understand why any of it should matter to us, we have two excellent speakers with us this morning. Fawzia Kufi from Afghanistan considers herself the favored daughter. But the truth is that she was the 17th of 23 children, and she was left out in the searing sun to die the day she was born. She was left out for an entire day and night, and when she did not die, the family relented and took her in. And from that day, Fawzia has never stopped fighting. Today, she's not only an elected MP from a region on the borders of China and Tajikistan, but she is also the first deputy speaker of the parliament in the history of Afghanistan, a very, very serious contender for presidentship in 2014. And she's a feisty woman who, in the profoundest sense, makes us understand that ultimately the personal is political and history turns on individual temperament and grit. The other speaker we have is Jason Burke, one of the most seasoned conflict reporters in the world. He has reported from pretty much every conflict zone. He's written some very seminal books, 9-11, uh, The History of the Al-Qaeda, The Road to Kandahar. He's a reporter with The Guardian and Observer, and we are very, very proud to have them here with us. Please. Fozia, I just gave our audience here just a snatch of your life, um, which is very, very tumultuous, very eventful. You've been the subject of many assassination attempts. You have two daughters. Uh, and I, what I found most intriguing is that even though there was this cataclysmic event the day you were born, you've actually followed in your father's footsteps, and you've never really hated him for what he did to you. Instead, you have used that to empower yourself politically. So today, when we are looking at the future of Afghanistan, what is the role of women and your own personal journey? Is it a parable for what will finally be the future of Afghanistan? Does it really lie in the hands of women? Could you share some of your personal story with us? Thank you. I would like to thank you first uh, for giving me this opportunity to be among these such wonderful group of people. Um, basically, what you hear from um, about Afghanistan is the image of war and terror, which is not the only image of Afghanistan. Afghanistan also has the other face, which is a country full of uh, relationship and values. It's a country which is located in a very important geographical location. And the history of civilization in Afghanistan doesn't start only after the fall of Taliban. Yes, after the fall of Taliban, there has been a golden opportunity for women in Afghanistan because of all the dark period of war and, and, um, and Taliban regime. Um, uh, women had the freedom at least uh, to breathe as a human being normally in the streets of Kabul. So that's why we call it as a golden opportunity. But the history of civilization, particularly for women, goes um, uh, back to the, um, to the history um, of Afghanistan 5,000 years um, of culture and, and, and tradition. Um, in the 1970s, uh, women were in the parliament. They were ministers. Um, unfortunately, in the 35 years of um, the war uh, period, we had some reverse, and that reverse basically affected women uh, in particularly. And the Taliban regime was one of that, um, I can say, the 
uh, dark spot in the history of Afghanistan. Um, the life of me as an individual living in, in such a country is not separated from the life of hundreds and thousands of women who live there. Um, yes, you're right, I didn't receive a very good welcome when I was just born. Um, uh, and that is because uh, my mother didn't want to give uh, birth to a girl that um, she suffers as much as she suffered as a woman. Um, uh, but uh, eventually she compensated the first day uh, with giving me so much love. And the first day um, I was born as a woman in a hugely traditional country. I learned to uh, struggle every moment of my life, even during the, 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 um, the birth. But my story became a successful, almost successful story. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of unheard stories like that in, in a country uh, like Afghanistan that become failed story, and mine is like a, uh, somehow a role model for other women because I managed to then find my way because of the continued you know, fight I had um, uh, in my da daily life. Um, the strength and the um, determination that women in Afghanistan have in politics right now is because of the fact that they have received so much discrimination and such a horrible life during civil war and pa Taliban time in particular. Um, everyday life under Taliban regime gave us the uh, strength to change something, to change something for equality, to change at least our atmosphere where we live for a better life for us. And I think you see, after Taliban regime, so many women turned to social and political life is because of the fact that they have gone through such a difficult life. Now they want to change it for their daughters and for their children and for the other women of Afghanistan. Therefore, I think women of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan have come such a long way in terms of um, changing the perspective. And this is something that you hardly receive from media. Basically, what media report about Afghanistan is suicide bombing and terrorist attack. We don't receive reports about the social changes that have happened in Afghanistan. And that goes to the nation of Afghanistan, to the civilized mind of people of Afghanistan. People of Afghanistan received uh, and welcomed democracy after 2001. Um, I completely disagree with some people when they say democracy is important to Afghanistan. Afghanistan had already a long age and long period of democracy. If democracy is, one of the elements of democracy is election. People actually participated, 70 to 80 percent of population participated in the last four elections we had. And they not only vote for the main, but they also voted for a woman. Yeah. I was one of those women who got not only vote according to the quota, which we have, 25% of reserve seats, but I got enough votes to compete the man. And even in some of the uh, places in one of the area, which is called, um, it's a close border with Iran province, um, they have two seats uh, reserved, uh, one for man, one for woman. But women of that province managed to defeat ma uh, man and come openly in an open competition, uh, um, occupying a man's seat in the parliament. So I don't think any Americans or Europeans went to that province to um, uh, dictate people to vote for a woman. That was actually people of that province who believed in a, in a woman capacity. So that is unlike many people say Afghanistan is a hugely traditional country and democracy does not work there. Yes, there are problems, but in the meantime, people of Afghanistan demonstrated such a huge res resilience towards war and, 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 and uh, violence. I'd, I'd just like to share with you that Fawzia speaks such beautiful English, and there's a story behind that, that during the Civil War, much like Malana, who was shot in Pakistan uh, recently, Fawzia uh, braved bullets and bombs to go to an English school when she was 10 years old. And she was determined to do that. And I read somewhere that you said you almost feel guilty that you were so focused on education at a time when everyone was dying around you, you know? Yes. But that, And Fawzia has also been voted the most, uh, one of the most brave women in the world by Newsweek and the World Economic Forum has chosen her as the, one of the young global leaders. And her story really is about the woman power in Afghanistan. We had Shukriya Barakzai last year, 
uh, who actually won a seat against her husband, which was lovely and sweet irony. You know. uh, before I come, to, come back to you, Fawzia, to ask what you think has been the legacy of America in Afghanistan, uh, Jason, I'd like to ask you two things. One, you know, you've been a reporter on ground. I think you were almost the first journalist to enter Tora Bora. Um, when, when did you really understand the scale of what would unfurl in Afghanistan with America's invasion? And number two, what do you think is the balance sheet when America leaves? What will its footprint really speak of? Um, the, first, <clears throat> the first time we, covering the war in 2001, the Americans were almost absent. I mean, we were talking about Tora Bora, and Tora Bora, most people would have forgotten it, I'm sure, but it was, or are young enough not to have known it, but it was where the Americans thought they'd cornered bin Laden at the end of the conflict uh, of the autumn of 2001. And it's a high mountain in the, uh, in the east of Afghanistan, close to the Pakistan border, where they thought bin Laden had been cornered up among these snowy peaks. And it's a place of astonishing natural beauty with these mountains and pine trees and fantastic plateau all around. And bin Laden was meant to be hiding up there. And the Americans started carpet bombing very high up with these B-52s flying in, dropping these enormous weapons in trying to get into the caves where the, the militants were hiding. Um, and I was there for about three weeks watching this going on. Um, a, a, a desultory fire coming back from the militants and mortars, but nothing much else. And the only Americans we saw, other than these B-52s going overhead and the stealth bombers and so forth, were small groups of special forces on the ground, just bearded men in their jeeps um, who were trying to control the local mujahideen, the local fighters who they were using as auxiliaries. They were almost absent at that point. When it really struck me that the Americans were arriving in Afghanistan was two or three months later when uh, I was on the Shamali Plains north of Kabul, uh, which were a wide, flat area with a strategic air base there, Bagram. Uh, and I'd seen Bagram many times under the Taliban. And as Fazir will remember, uh, Bagram at that stage, as all the airports were, uh, even Kabul airport, was a ruin, basically. Nothing much going in and out. Uh, nothing at all going in and out of Bagram. Um, and in a desolate plain, all the people had left, all the refu they'd all gone to, as refugees to Pakistan or elsewhere, uh, and there was nothing at all apart from a front line with, again, some backward-forward fighting. Um, and suddenly, I was up there in February, March of 2002, and there was this immense operation as the Americans arrived. And it was the first time as a reporter I'd really seen what it means when you know, the US turns up somewhere. And they turned up in enormous strength with thousands of people coming in, thousands of planes flying in and out, the food being flown four and a half thousand miles from Germany because they hadn't set up camp kitchens yet and they didn't trust the local produce, uh, roads being built, a, uh, a shop being put up for the local, for the soldiers which was selling kind of uh, Beyonce CDs and uh, camouflaged Bibles um, and hot tamales. It took me quite a long time to work out what a hot tamale was, but it's a kind of little sweet bean thing, which is quite chili-like, actually. It's quite good, but um, uh, when you're just eating food that comes from Germany for every day. Um, and, and, and it was just this incredible operation of Uncle Sam arriving somewhere. And, and what struck me, talking to people, and these were, these were uh, young soldiers, often from really nasty parts of the US. I mean, the, the, we often talk about the American soldiers as being you know, almost uh, the embodiment of modern whatever, neo-imperialism, etc., etc., etc. These guys are not the embodiment of anything other than poor communities out in the Midwest somewhere or the Deep South. Uh, you know, the most marginalized elements of a American society uh, arriving in one of the most marginalized parts of the world. Um, but they were arriving and there's this huge operation, just immense amounts of material, men, money coming in without the slightest idea of <laughs> where they were, what was happening where they were, and why they were there. Uh, and, I mean, you know, it was an astonishing thing. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, the second part of your question was 10 years later, you know, what do we get? Um, well, you now have that process that I saw in 2002 in reverse, because they're now 
all these big trucks and everything else, all the planes are now going in the other direction, they're all leaving and they're dismantling their hot tamale stands and they're, you know, uh, and it's all going. Um, and, and, you know, what have they left? Uh, as ever with Afghanistan, or anywhere, frankly, it's very, very difficult to say. Um, you know, Fazi and I were just talking about this a moment earlier, and leaving aside the, the specific American project, which had, in fact, many, many different elements, which is one of the reasons it ran into such difficulties, uh, particularly because there wasn't the capacity to achieve any one of those aims. Um, what, what comes after 2014, when basically the, the, the American and you know, other international troops leave, you have a very optimistic scenario, which is you know, prosperity, stability, rule of law, democracy. You know, Afghanistan going towards the sort of Swedish model, um, unlikely. Uh, and then you have, you have a much more negative vision, which is the sort of total chaos, the violence of the 90s, but worse because everybody's better armed, there's more money around their regional powers that they're going to get involved in a different way and so forth. Um, I, I'd say I don't think that the, really pe the, the real pessimism is justified. Um, I, I am moderately optimistic in a sense because I think that the inherent resilience of the Afghan people who are used to dealing with situations of immense chaos, uh, of immense change, uh, but still functioning, will hold the place together. Uh, and th there are a lot of people who don't want to lose what they've gained in the last 10 years, and some people have gained a fair amount. Um, there, there's an inherent flexibility in the Afghan system, which means that conflict occurs, but can be contained in a sense. Um, and that the nightmare scenario won't happen, the, the, the optimistic scenario won't happen either. Uh, but the, the real strength of the Afghan people will, and people like Fazir, will pull <coughs> Afghanistan through in a way that will genuinely bewilder many people in the West who will look at what's going on and think, how can that hold together? You know, Fozia, Jason's told us what he thinks is the mixed footprint of uh, America, but I was intrigued by what you said, that, you know, we, we tend to look at Afghanistan from 2001 and, you know, really through the prism of war. And I don't think anyone here sitting really has a sense of the Afghani culture and society and you know, how much of what you said was uh, women's emancipation is really a product of the war and the repressions there's been, or how much of it actually runs in the veins of the society. And, you know, you've said somewhere that you feel that America has been all wrong in the way it has looked at the war, because it looks at the root of terrorism in Afghanistan, whereas the roots actually lie elsewhere. And so I'd love you to comment on that, you know, that yet you don't really want the uh, American forces to leave in 2014. So you know, how do you read this 10 years that has actually been a cataclysm across the world? It's, in a sense, beggared the American economy. Uh, it has, you know, when you go to Kashmir, you feel a lot of people are afraid of 2014 because there is a sense that the Taliban may even enter uh, in, in, into Kashmir, you know, so it has ramifications for all of us. So do share with us what you think of it. Well, before uh, commenting on what you said, um, I would like to say that um, Americans came to Afghanistan because uh, their territory and soil was attacked. Not because just to listen to the shouting of Afghan people that we are a victim of terrorism. They didn't ask any Afghans whether they are needed in Afghanistan when they decided to come. Now they leave without asking people of Afghanistan whether this is the right time for us to leave. So basically we can say that they come, created a mass, and now they want to leave. Uh, without, uh, you know, looking at the ground realities of Afghanistan, without looking at the situation that whether we are, you know, how things will go after 2014. On the, uh, well, let me make it clear that the Afghan war, the war in Afghanistan is not an Afghan war. It's a global, but rather a regional uh, dimensional war. Um, the reason that it has found its kind of roots and leaves in Afghanistan is because Afghanistan has um, so much vulnerability that has not been used as Afghanistan's strength, but rather been used as Afghanistan's weakness. First of all, the long uncontrolled border with Pakistan and Iran is our vulnerability. Second, of course, the economy that was devastated in the last uh, 35 years of war 
And third is the education level, law education level of people, in particular in certain areas of Afghanistan. So these weaknesses were used for Taliban and Al-Qaeda growth um, uh, during 90s. And of course, the civil war, which you know, kind of paved the way for Taliban to come to Afghanistan. During the civil war and during the Taliban, I remember that the only, perhaps, the few, one, one of the few countries that stood by the nation of Afghanistan was India. The whole country, world left Afghanistan. And even the US and Europeans didn't have a representation uh, or embassy in Afghanistan. So the country was basically left alone. Um, when we were talking about the uh, regional terrorism, many countries were saying this is a civil war, let it for Afghans to deal with it. The words of sovereignty and freedom are the words and values that people of Afghanistan invested their blood and treasure for the history. If you look at Afghanistan history, it's a country full of fighting for freedom and for uh, sovereignty. But when the 11 September attack happened, many Afghans, despite the fact that they love the word of sovereignty and they can you know, lose everything they have in that, in that word, to gain that word, they went uh, they welcome uh, American and the coalition forces presence in Afghanistan because they know that uh, the vision of or the mission of Afghan people and the international community is the same. We're fighting for terrorism. Despite the mistakes that the world did in the in, in 90s in Afghanistan. So many people welcomed them. When they came to Afghanistan, uh, as a woman, not only me, but many people, we didn't care who is coming to Afghanistan. The only thing for us which was important was that we could go to the streets of Kabul without wearing a burqa and breathe as a human being. That was the main thing for us. That was the main uh, message for us. Um, up to 2003, 2004, things were going in the right direction. You know, there was no sign of Taliban. Um, there were many hope and um, enthusiasm around uh, things that will go for better. Huge expectation was raised. Um, all of a sudden, the Iraq war happened, and the whole world focused in Iraq. And I think that is the time that the Afghanistan war became almost the second or third agenda for the world. And this was the time that, uh, that uh, the Taliban revised their strategy um, and came back to Afghanistan. Um, now, who are Taliban? Um, many people define Taliban as uh, unemployed, uneducated young people, which I'm strongly against it. Because when my husband was in jail during Taliban, and I went to see my husband, Afghanistan prisons were managed by people who could, couldn't speak one word of our languages, Dari or Pashto. They were speaking all other languages, um, Arab, Pakistani, you know, all of the other languages. And now when sometimes the Taliban spokesperson say Afghanistan is an occupied country, and yesterday they actually, um, when the election, presidential election date was announced, they reacted and say we are not going to participate in this election because Afghanistan is an occupied country. And the question is, what is the difference between this occupation and the occupation during Taliban, which in the same Wazir Akbar Khan, where uh, actually Americans and Europeans live now, during that time, it was Arabs and Pakistanis and Chechenian people. So what is the difference between two? Maybe in language? It's the same occupation, if you call it occupation. So Taliban don't, under the claim of Islam and religion, actually, they pursue the neighboring country's agenda. And people of Afghanistan know that now. And that's why I don't think that Taliban could come back with the same agenda that they had in, in 1996 when they first came. So, People of Afghanistan now are aware that Taliban are pursuing um, neighboring countries, and the world also must, be, must know that, especially after the you know, arresting and killing of uh, Osama bin Laden a few kilometers from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamabad. from Islamabad. I'm surprised why still, still the world continues to focus in the villages of Afghanistan, rather than you know, shifting their focus to where it, the, the potential threat can not only be to Afghanistan, but to the world as well. You know, again, just to share a biographical detail uh, of Fawzia, she mentioned that her husband was in jail. Actually, the Taliban had put him in jail, uh, you know, as a kind of retaliation for her standing for elections and winning the elections. 
and her husband contracted tuberculosis in jail and passed away uh, a few months after that. And uh, ironically, her father was shot by the Mujahideen uh, when she was three years old. And she has also had an assassination attempt while she was in the car with her younger daughter. And every time she goes out to, uh, you know, to campaign or to work, she leaves letters for her daughter. And I think that's been created as a book, Letters to My daughter, uh, Daughters. And both the girls uh, heartily support the fact that Fawzia continues to be a fiercely political person. Uh, so, you know, a salute to you for that, Fawzia. Can I say one, one sentence? Um, I put my life, which is the political, um, it's an explanation of political life of Afghan people in the past 30 years. I put it not because I wanted to talk about my own life. Mine is, a, as I said, an, a success story. But the life of women and children in Afghanistan that are unheard are much more horrible than mine. Yes. You know, you'll hear this bell very often through the day. It's a reminder for us to stay on track and be on time. So, Jason, very quickly, uh, you know, she mentioned that very quick Afghanistan fell into being the third or fourth war. So when you look back on this decade, what is the whole 9-11 wars meant? You know, what is it? Uh, and have we gone past that wave? Are we in some new zone now? Um, history of the world in three and a bit minutes. The... Um, the, the Five minutes. <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Um, if you look at the last decade, um, what I call the 9-11 wars, which is a slight misnomer because all the conflicts of that decade, I'm talking about the various conflicts linked with American interventions, with militant Islam uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, the violence we saw and the bombs going off and all the rest of it over the last years. It's an amorphous concept that, that is quite difficult because we all know what this was, when I, what we're talking about, but there's no one word for it. If you look at that period from, say, 9-11 through to now, or let's say the death of Osama bin Laden, I think you can see a clear sh change in phase over that period. You had an early and immediate explosion of violence with 9-11, with the war in Afghanistan. There was then a lull. Iraq then re-energized the conflict in a very real way. Um, and we saw then a real intensity, a very powerful wave of violence in the Middle East, in uh, the West as well, with bombs in London, in, in Madrid, elsewhere, with riots and so forth, with a, a huge amount of radicalization and, and mobilization around the world. Um, subsequently, things have, slight, have, have begun to die away. It doesn't always feel like it, but when you look at that intensity back in 2005 and 2006, it's died away. The place that hasn't died away is in Afghanistan, uh, where from 06 you saw a surge of violence um, to an extent in Pakistan. But elsewhere, we've moved into a new phase with the Arab Spring, the death of bin Laden. Uh, there's a whole new cycle starting in which Al-Qaeda, the group started by bin Laden back in 1988, is, is, is much less present. It's not a principal player. And, and I think that's very important to remember. So if you look at that decade, uh, I think it's absolutely wrong to talk about victories in any sense. Um, on the one hand, the Western nations that felt themselves attacked in 9-11 have survived. Yes, at losing some of their fr privileges, free speech, um, changes in, in, in their rights and legal situations and so forth, but nothing that is irredeemable, uh, irreversible. Um, the, the, for Al Qaeda, uh, now almost shattered as a core organization, uh, that's obviously a major problem. Bin Laden's dead, most of the senior people are dead as well. But the ideology is much more widespread. It's the, so neither have won, if you like. The problem, of course, I mean, it's a double defeat, is how I describe it. The, the, the real casualties are the people in the middle. Uh, Afghanistan being right in the middle, where we've had 30,000 dead civilians minimum. Uh, if you add up all the, the, the dead, and I count those kids from Michigan, the American soldiers too, all the uh, whoever, the, 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 the young Taliban who are recruited into these things, they're casualties of war too. Uh, the Iraqi civilians who died in their tens of thousands, so and so if, if you add them all together, you're looking at 200 to 300,000 dead and probably two or three times that injured 
maimed often for life. That's a million people. That's a, a lot, a lot of casualties. That's a lot of dead people. And I think when people look back on that period, those 10 years, uh, in a few decades, when historians start posing the real questions that us journalists really can't answer, when there are questions in exams and so forth in schools about what happened in that period in the way that we now ask what happened in the 1950s or something, then people will say, what were they doing? What was this collective madness that took over half the world in, in that period? Um, quite what the answers to the, the questions that the historians will be, I don't know. That was the most succinct, epic history answer, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there are just so many questions that remain. Personally, for me, listening to Shukriya last year and to Fawzia this year is again a lesson in humility that so much of our troubles is that we articulate the problem wrong and we see through colored glasses. And part of the, the malignness of this last decade was that we were trapped in the wrong language. We were trapped in the language that was set off by Bush uh, and, and the Western world, and we lived in a black and white mannequin world. These 10, 10 years have at least broken that down. We understand today, and Jason's book has spoken of that again and again, that there is no one terror project, there is no one problem in, uh, you know, that cuts across axis, but that it is an agglomeration of uh, grievances, of cultural uh, and local uh, influences that are expressing themselves. And uh, if we leave countries in the hands of people like Fawzia Kufi, uh, we will be in a safer place than having the kind of air strafing that is still going on. Thank you so much for listening in. That one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we 